Okay, and we're going to go live now on Facebook. So just a moment while I do that. Okay, so you can watch this session on Facebook as well. Um, it's good if you, you're having any problems with sound or if you want subtitles. Okay, that's looking good. Right, so if you've just joined us, welcome to um, this session for World Teachers Day. I'm here with Shona. Shona, happy World Teachers Day. How yeah. are you? Thank you. Yeah, same to you. Fantastic. So uh, privileged to be here to share this moment with everyone who's joined us. Excellent. We're really happy to have you here. Before I hand over to you, I'd just like to tell people a little bit about you. Um, so one second, let me find what I want to say about you. Okay, so this is Shona. She's an experienced teacher and teacher trainer in the British Council in Spain. Um, she specialises in a range of life stages and methodology courses uh, for state school teachers in bilingual programmes. She's collaborated on CLIL projects, so that's content language integrated learning projects across Spain and internationally. As well as being a blogger for the British Council Spain blog, Shona has presented at many teaching conferences, including IATEFL 2021. So we're really lucky to have you today. Um, and it's, it's over to you, Shona. I think that's all from me. I'm here if you need me. OK, thanks, Joe. OK, I'll share my screen and then we can get started. OK, let's get into presentation mode. OK. So thank you, everyone. Big thank you to all of you for joining me today. As I said before, it is a real pleasure to be here on World Teachers Day. Uh, and I'm really grateful you've taken the time out to, to join us today and particularly me in this in this session in which we're going to look at how to get our learners to to feel more confident in their speaking in our in our lessons. OK, so let's kick off. Let's get started. OK, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. But as Joe said, you can obviously add your questions there and we'll get back to them at the end. First of all, an enormous thank you to all those people who have participated, all of you who have participated in the survey. I just want to very, very quickly just go through some of the results of there because I think they're, they're quite important for us. So you can see on the screen there, 67% said that they sometimes felt uncomfortable speaking a language that's not, that's not their mother tongue in, in their lessons, which I think is actually very positive because it means that we can empathize with our learners. We know how they feel and um, we understand their challenges and their difficulties. So that for me is actually quite positive. Then we had almost 50% of students who um, can move around the classroom freely sometimes and 25% that have less opportunities to do that in the classroom. So some of the things that we're going to look at today hopefully will help with uh, creating a more active dynamic, more active participation among our students. In terms of the, the quantity of content or the students who can have a say in what the content is, this was kind of 50-50. So half of you said that they could have a say in choosing the content and half of you said that that wasn't the case, obviously because of curriculum and syllabus limitations, yeah? And more than 74% of you agreed or strongly agreed that students have planning time before speaking tasks. So we're gonna go into these things in a little bit more detail. And if you have any questions, again, like we said, just get them in the chat, okay? You also were asked to have um, to add some comments, okay? And some of your ideas on encouraging students to, to take a more active um, approach in the lessons was either getting them to recount things or retell stories or anecdotes. Some, some of you mentioned wanting to work on their listening skills and improve this kind of reciprocal communicative aspect of teaching. And then there was the importance of maximizing student talking time, encouraging them to keep to the target language, and others mentioned use of strategies like, you know, improving their non-verbal body language, using pausing. And of course, if I'm speaking too fast for you today, please tell me in the chat, say, show us slow down. And that focus on intonation. So those were just some of the things that came up in the, the survey, the question that we did. And once again, thank you very much, because that's really, really useful information for me as a teacher and teacher educator. 
Okay, so moving now into our content, just quick overview. We're going to look at some of the challenges, like we said, you know, perhaps feeling a bit uncomfortable and um, lacking in confidence in our in our English. Different types of talk that we might see in the classroom. Um, and then we're going to look at tips and ideas that will engage your learners. So, like we said, speaking in real time clearly is pretty challenging. Um, you know, we, um, we might feel like loss of face if we have teenagers. Sometimes the primary students are a lot more um, keen to participate because they don't feel so self-conscious. And clearly, you know, for us as teachers, as I said before, we know we can understand that our students might, might feel um, that they don't have the confidence to share some of the knowledge that they, they have in the content. So, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that there's a comfortable, risk-free environment in the classroom, and we're going to look at ways to do that. So the first thing to do is think about the kind of talk in your lessons. Now, you may have an idea about this question if you have done the survey, but just want you to think and maybe add to the chat what kind of talk is there in your lessons. So I'd like to see some activity in the chat or in the Q&A section. Just give you a minute. What kind of talk is there in your lessons? Okay, I can see some things. Okay, nice. Leila says debates and role playing. Lovely. Okay, talking about hobbies. Nice one. Okay, it's all coming fast and furious now. Malak tells stories. We've got routines, mute food and music, a whole range of different topics there. So we've also we've got topics that we can discuss and we've also got different kinds of talk. Thank you for that. You are a lot of amazing ideas there. OK, I'm going to show you. My slide. Ooh, this is a bit more formal. <laughs> Here we have talk as defined in the Journal of Applied Language Studies. So we've got organizational talk, as you can see there, this is the what, when and how of the classroom, getting ourselves organized, you know, have you got your books, you know, the logistics, let's say, of the classroom. Then we have the social talk, like you mentioned in the chat, you know, how they're feeling, um, how their week has been. Then we have critical talk, asking why and how come questions. You know, this is like higher order thinking, moving away from just expecting them to recall information, but getting them to really think and, um, you know, explore different topics. Then you have expert talk, which is like the formal voice of the subject. When our students know the content, they have the language resources that they need and they can talk like experts. Then we have exploratory talk, okay, which is maybe among the students in those pairs and groups that you mentioned. So they're exploring ideas, they're feeling comfortable, obviously in our target language. Then we've got meta talk, which might be explaining some of the grammar, the things that they need, the, the, the tenses that they need, the vocabulary that they need in order to talk about the, the topic that you have um, presented in the lesson. And then we've got the pedagogic talk, which obviously is coming from us as the teachers and facilitators. So, you know, th th that just gives you an idea of the different kinds of talk that we might have in our lessons. It's a bit more formal as compared to some of our answers, but it does help us reflect on, you know, as we as educators, we as teachers in our lessons, do we have this range in our lessons? And if we don't, maybe we need to include it more critical talk. Perhaps we need to include more exploratory talk. Perhaps we need a little bit more talking about, you know, the grammar that they need. It depends on your teaching context, okay? And kind of to summarize that, I have a much easier uh, visual to show you. And this is kind of related to the idea of a discourse slope, yeah? We're taking our learners, maybe if they're, you know, lower levels and beginners, we're taking them up through this kind of um, uh, increment in their linguistic skills and their language skills. And we're, you know, 
introducing them to classroom language like can I have a rubber please you know um you know what's your opinion if they're a little bit older talking to their partners maybe we're if we're doing content we might be helping them with the academic language more formal um, functional phrases and language that they need in order to talk about the subject itself the content of the language and this also applies to ELT we move you know from the younger learners in primary with just a logistical classroom language and you know pets and hobbies we move then into more kind of academic academic abstract topics and obviously we, we then supply them with or facilitate rather than supply. We facilitate the kind of language that they need to talk about science or they need to talk about art or they need to talk about the subject that you are teaching, okay? So, you know, I think that's a much nicer visual to see how we are facilitating their learning and their language skills. And of course, our focus today is how we're gonna do that through the skill of speaking. So moving on. I do have a definition and some, some kind of key ideas related to exploratory talk as opposed to presentational talk. So when you've got your students in those groups and pairs, they're going to be exploring the ideas, exploring the topics, whether it's hobbies, whether it's, um, you know, how to improve their neighborhood, for example. And they're going to be working with their partners, trying to construct, um, you know, some kind of... Um, presentation that they may need to give, but they have the opportunity to explore it with their group or their partner. Everyone is expected to participate. They can try out some ideas, they have to listen to others, and then they may join the, our, their ideas together. They're going to look at some of the challenges, maybe they have differing opinions from their partners or from different groups, and they have to include even soft skills where they are uh, taking turns, listening to their partner. And I'm going to show you here, for example, some of the things that we would expect them to do when they are exploring the topics, exploring the topics through exploratory talk. So they'd be listening to their partner, sharing this common, common knowledge. They'd be turn taking. They're going to be agreeing and disagreeing. They're going to be adding to the conversation. Okay. And then when they go into presentational talk, when they present their ideas, they're going to be having the opportunity to stop, talk for a longer period of time, maybe two or three minutes to present their ideas on the slides. They're going to have to organize the ideas clearly. They might be using signposting phrases. Yeah. And these are the kind of things that we need to help them with. We need to facilitate um, in order for them to feel comfortable and gain in their confidence while they're speaking. OK, I mentioned in the questionnaire the concept of scaffolding. So let's say if we have on a poster these signposting phrases or phrases for agreeing and disagreeing, that would be an example of scaffolding. And I'm going to show you a nice little visual I have here. So we as the teachers, we're going to help provide them with the phrases that they need um, in order to agree or disagree. Or we're going to use some sequencing words to signpost what they're saying. First, I'm going to talk about this slide, then I'll talk about the other slide. And that is the scaffolding that we are providing. OK, so if you were a little bit confused by that question, in the questionnaire, this is what I was referring to, this temporary support to help our students express themselves in spoken form and in their oral production skills. And then of course, once they have that confidence, we're going to take it away. Okay, I have an example for you of some, some kind of scaffolding, some phrases that my students came up with. And of course you could have this on the wall of your classroom or you could project it on the board. This is just one example, clearly for our learners who are a little bit older of some, persuasive language that they might want to use if they are convincing someone of their opinion um, phrases for giving your opinion. And of course, then you might also have some of the content vocabulary that they need. This is the perfect example of scaffolding. Yeah, you're showing this to your students and hopefully they're going to be using it. They have it to reference. They can see it on the on the board or on the on the classroom wall on a poster. And you are providing them with the scaffolding that hopefully at one point you will take down and they will be producing it because they've had the opportunity to practice with their, their classmates, okay? Now, moving on very quickly. 
what can we do as um as teachers as facilitators in the lesson now there's one thing that um is a bit controversial sometimes i'd like to get your opinion about you know when you're trying to engage all your students are you a person who likes getting students to have their hands up or are you a hands down person let's see if you can add that to the chat which do you prefer hands up or hands down okay <laughs> thank you okay hands <laughs> Well, I'm never going to be able to keep up with that clearly, but um, at the moment it looks kind of like hands up is winning. <laughs> okay. You know, I have nothing against hands up. I think it's a great idea um, for like, uh, as a way to test, you know, what percentage of your students are actually, or appear to be, happy with the content and um, that they potentially know the answers they're participating but i would like you to think about those students who are perhaps a little less confident who may think that their answer could be wrong and don't want to embarrass themselves by putting their hands up or you know the learners who just don't want to kind of model their sentence because they don't have you know they're they're very grammar focused and they don't have this, the, the grammar 100% correct. So therefore they're not going to put their hand up. And you know yourselves as teachers that you will have a group of students and the super confident students will be the ones there with their hands up, me, me, me. And they'll be more participative. And then you'll have the ones at the back sitting, hoping that you know, you're not gonna nominate them. So I found this technique, it's not my technique, it's just a very good technique that I've been using now for a couple of years. And may, many of you I'm sure may have, may have used this technique yourselves, but I find it really, really useful. So let's see if I can explain it to you uh, in a way that is easy and, and easy to put in practice for your, your daily classes, your daily um, teaching. So the idea is, is PPPB. Let's see if I can say that again without making a mistake. P, P, B. So you pose your question, you ask the question, and then you pause, you give them some thinking time, super important as well, really, really important. So you ask the question, you pose the question, you then pause, you give your students thinking time, because, you know, we know that if we don't give them thinking time, the chances are the answer that they give is going to be maybe not so good. And then you pounce, so you nominate someone, uh, and then you have to bounce the question to another student. So you're giving more students the opportunity to, um, to collaborate, to add to the discussion. So this takes us away from just a kind of teacher asks questions, student replies, and teacher says, well done end of story that's what we want to avoid yeah so you know rather than just asking the questions and all your students putting their or the keen students the confident students raising their hands you can try to put this in it's a little tiny change in your classroom but i'm sure you're going to see immediate results just by putting this one small thing in practice so if you've used this in the classroom maybe you could add that to the chat yeah so posing the question stop for a moment give them thinking time nominate a student and then ask another student or the the student number one the first student can then choose a friend or choose a partner and then you can take it around the class and it creates more of a debate you're you know you're you're extending the discussion you're just extending their discourse and you're getting all of the students participating. Clearly the expectation of the students has to be that everyone may have to participate. There's no one who's allowed to sit at the back and not participate, yeah? They may be chosen by their partners. And I have myself used a ball to do this. It's a bit like basketball. So when you pose the question and pause, and then when you pounce, you throw the ball at the student and then they can throw the ball or a piece of paper. Um, round the classroom and they can then open the discussion up and you know basically share their ideas share their opinions really easy to put in practice and, and I'd highly recommend it because it does make a difference so apart from that maybe you've used that what other things have you done in your lessons to get more engagement I'm curious to know apart from what you added to the survey so Letitia Perez she says I've done it but I didn't know it had a name well there you go Letitia if you can say P P P B. <laughs> you should get a gold star for that. 
what other things have you done? What do you do in your classrooms around the world to get your students engaged? Just very quickly in the chat. Putting them in small groups. Thank you, Laila. Working in teams, Corinne Conti. Thank you very much. Pulling cards. Ooh, that sounds like an interesting one. And there's one that I've never heard of, the Apple technique. I'm going to have to go and Google that later. Wow. So some, some things that, that I would recommend that has certainly have worked for me and I would recommend that you, you try them, maybe you've done this yourself, is, you know, you, you as a teacher, you are creating engagement, you're an interesting person, you're going to be spending a lot of time with them, you are a role model, so if you kind of try and do some tweaks on how you, you know, present the information by, for example, maybe trying to shorten your questions, shorten the sentences, and that doesn't mean dumbing down, it just means kind of reducing it for maybe particular groups of students so that they're not bamboozled by too much information. You may want to use prompts, for example, having a starter sentence. You could put that on the board just to get them speaking, giving them a helping hand, that scaffolding that we mentioned. You may have a model sentence and you can ask the learners to repeat it because, you know, nowadays some people are a bit scared of like drilling. And I did see someone mentioned about choral drilling. It's actually a very good technique for automatizing phrases and helping their pronunciation. So, you know, if, if that's going to work for your learners, well, then, then all, by all means do it. Yeah. Expanding on your learner sentences through our PPPB or pose, pause, pounce, bounce. As you're presenting some new content, you might want to emphasize the keywords so that the students are aware that those are important phrases that they need to they need to be aware of using chunks and phrases of functional language. And of course, you know, you might want to use some of their mother tongue because it could be a tool to help them learn. Um, and I see someone's mentioned, I think that's a MacBull reduced grammatical forms. Um, yeah, so, you know, maybe in your normal conversational English yourself, you're, you kind of use quite complex language, depending on your learners, you might want to reduce that. And just these simple little tweaks um, can help our students, help them gain in confidence. We are the model for them, and then they will hopefully replicate what we do in the classroom. And you have in the box there, obviously using visuals, using prompt words, you might have them on the board, on the walls, classroom posters, and as we mentioned before, really important wait time, giving them some time to think. Nice visual for you here, one that I found by, um, designed by Sylvia Duckworth. If you ever find her visuals, I find them really helpful. I have this, this you know, as an image in my classroom and I have it on the wall to remind me because we're very busy people, it's easy to forget. That, you know, you yourself, you can have questioning techniques that will um, create the expectation among your students that you expect more. You're not, you're not happy with a one word answer or, you know, a, a phrase of two words. You're going to ask them, what do you think? And why do you think that? And how do you know this? So having these for yourself and having these on the walls of your classroom is going to be really useful in generating the expectation that we don't just reply with one or two words. There's the expectation there that we are going to be extending what we say as much as possible because we're all interested in learning about everyone's ideas. And of course, we hope that our students will be responding with some of these chunks and phrases. And again, it's so easy to get your students to make this to be added to the, the classroom walls, yeah? Okay, other things, of course, are fishing. Your students know a lot. They've probably attended a lot of lessons. Using them as a starting point, trying to fish for what they know, get them to show off their learning. It's empowering. It makes them feel like it's important to learn and, you know, it's worthwhile spending the time. Get them to brainstorm for vocabulary before you feed in the, the additional content and vocabulary that they need, yeah? You can even turn this into a competition, make it a speed competition to find keywords in the course in the course book. Maybe you've highlighted them from a text. You know, it takes five minutes to go in, get them to do the speed competition with their partner. They can have a list of words, they can do it in pairs, they can do it in groups, or even get your students to create a poster to be placed on the wall or even create a cheat sheet for the notebook. You know, a cheat sheet is like you're allowing them to cheat. They create their cheat sheet and they just share it with a partner. Clearly, these are 
um, starting points. And we're hoping that when they do this, they're going to be collaborating with their partner, working together and sharing in oral production yeah, the vocabulary that they've found, they'll be presenting the vocabulary that they've brainstormed to another team. They're going to be sharing the words that they've found, you know, and it's all building their confidence in, in speaking. Okay. So let's see. One really important idea for me is creating a hook. This hook to get them all engaged, or some people call it a wow starter trying to tweak the name of the unit, for example, into something that's going to get them engaged. And one way that I do this is to use GIFs. I love GIFs. And you can see on my slide here, just this little blue text at the bottom, GIF maker tenor, you can make your own GIFs. And you know, it's just a simple way to get them engaged in the topic. So I have one for you. Let's see. My hook for you today is Breaking news, teacher gives gum to students. Okay, so I had this topic, this text that I wanted them to read. And I thought of this headline, show them the gif. They're all gonna be wondering what on earth is teacher talking about? What's Shona talking about? Teacher gives gum to students. Okay, so I'm kind of, you know, engaging them in the topic. What did I do next? That was my hook, okay? Teacher gives students gum to eat in class, and my students need to speculate, speculate sorry, about why the teacher might have done this. Okay, some, can I get some speculation in the chat, please? Why would a teacher give a student gum? You know, it's like a big, no, we don't give gum to students. Why would a teacher do that? A reward, thank you, thank you. Nice one there, someone's mentioned rewards. <laughs> bad teacher bad breath maybe <laughs> okay to encourage them yeah so i've got this text i've got this text all about all about i'll give you some clues so i'm going to show you a sentence frame that i'm going to give my students eating chewing gum does what what does eating chewing gum do it helps with your bad breath it keeps your mouth busy Anything else? And I have some key academic language that I want them to use. So we've got produces, creates, enhances. What does eating, chewing gum produce, create or enhance? Any ideas? It makes me nervous. Thank you, Mohammed. Oh, nice one. Mohammed, activate brains. Mm. Well done. So I had this text about how chewing gum actually activates your brain. It does. It helps your memory. And it was a very boring, very dense text. This was my hook. Simple as that. This was my hook to get my students interested in reading this kind of long texts about memory. And the headline was teacher gives gum to students. So you know, that's it. That's the hook. That's I've got them engaged. I've got them wanting to read my text. If I had time today, I would show you the text, but I don't. Um, and I've just, you know, created this engagement and they're all going to be collaborating together using that exploratory talk, using my sentence frame there, using those key verbs that they need. And they're all going to be speculating using higher order thinking. And now they want to read the text to find out why did the teacher give the students gum? OK. Another way to do this and get them exploring a topic is by using an image. Okay, in the chat box, any ideas what on earth this could be? And this is taken from the Learn English Teens British Council website. So a leaf, a tree, well done. Nice, a crocodile. <laughs> okay. It would be amazing to read all those answers. Wow, Arfa, Shaida, I hope I'm saying your name right. That was like a really nice answer there. Bark of a tree. So, so far, no one's guessed what it is. A dragon. Whoa. Okay, I'm going to put you out of your misery. Here it is. There you go. It's a dog's nose or snout, if you want to get technical. Yeah. So you could have your students exploring using the target vocab. It could be, it may be, it might be. 
And of course, maybe your topic is something to do with animals. Yeah. So again, we've created this kind of hook, this engagement. And here's my wow starter, my wow starter, my wow, wow, <laughs> like a dog. Did you know there's an animal that has a sense that's 100,000 times better than humans? Which animal do you think it is? Any guesses? Well done. So clearly there's a connection between my previous picture, yeah? Oh, an octopus. Never heard that one before. And here we are. Here's our little puppy. Yeah. So, yeah, I know clearly you can tweak it for the age of your learners. But, you know, have a look at the Guinness Book of Records. You can find a Guinness record for absolutely everything. That could be your wow starter, yeah? And clearly we're going to go on then to talk about dogs. What can dogs smell better than we can? What can they smell that we can't smell? And we're talking about the senses, et cetera, et cetera. And what we've done basically is get them talking, interested in the topic, happy to explore more and find out more. OK, so that's the idea. You would have them in pairs, you would have them in groups, et cetera, and getting them engaged with the topic. OK. Now, another thing is a little. It's really easy and I'm sure you've got a bag of, you know, like a carpet bag, Mary Poppins bag full of tricks and things that you use. Here are two things that I use. I have a motivation spray, gets them all talking. And this is this is known as like a clill balloon. I use it for content classes. But, you know, it's just a fun way um, for students to participate in the lesson. It gets them engaged, gets them talking. Let me, first of all, explain the motivation spray. We know that sometimes students come into our lessons and they're just tired. It might be at the end of the day. They might have just come from physical education or they're just at a bad day and they're tired. So this spray in summertime here in Spain has a little bit of water and I can squirt that on them for fun. Um, or it has nothing inside. It's magic. OK, but just having this spray, if they are feeling like, you know, tired and demotivated, you know, just having some little gimmick like this is going to get them engaged. Um, and obviously they can take turns spraying on each other. You can even have a silence spray. Um, it's not going to get them talking for the activity, but it is a prompt. It's a gimmick. It's something that's going to keep your students engaged in the lesson. Yeah, when they start to, it could be a wake up spray. Well done. <laughs> and then the balloon you can use a ball, you can use a balloon, and basically you use this and you add questions with a, a marker. You divide the ball or the balloon into these different sections, as you can see here. And they basically throw the ball to their partners. They ask the question um, if their thumb, the thumb of their right hand lands on a section which has a question, then they have to ask some the question, someone the question, or they have to answer the question. OK, so it could be on any topic. It's just one way to get them engaged, you know, a little bit of changing the energy, not having them sitting down. I know from the questionnaire survey comments that, you know, we're, our classrooms can be a little bit limiting. They might be full of desks. There may not be a lot of space, but this is a kind of easy thing to do, you know, just for like a 10 minute review, throwing the ball around. The questions can be about anything. They can be simple questions. They can be complex questions. Obviously, you might want to get your students to create this. You could have two balls, two balloons. Um, and this is going to get them communicating in the classroom. Yeah. So a simple idea that is, is really helpful. And again, having a bit more of a dynamic 10 minutes where they're using their English or the target language in a fun way. Yeah. Another activity which I love is called Post-it Pilot. I'm a big fan of Post-its. Obviously, you can just cut up and recycle bits of paper. Um, but, you know, you give this to each group. So you divide your large group into smaller groups, OK? You give them a post, some Post-its or pieces of paper. You pose your question. And amongst the students, amongst the students in the group, they have to put their ideas on the paper. They add their ideas to the post-its and then they choose a spokesperson. And there are all kinds of ways of choosing the spokesperson. I'm sure many of you have fantastic ideas. One could be like a special stone. The person with a special stone is the spokesperson. 
The person with the pink poster is the spokesperson, yeah? They gather all their ideas together, but they have to choose the spokesperson. And of course, when you do this, you have to rotate the spokesperson, yeah? They have to take turns. But that person is going to summarize all the group ideas. And what's this doing? It's taking the fear out of giving your answer, which may be wrong, because you've collaborated, you've explored with your partner, your partners in the group. You've exchanged ideas and you're going to collaborate together, collect all those ideas, and then your one sp spokesperson is going to present those ideas to the group. And clearly, if you do this over several lessons, then you can rotate the spokesperson and also change the, you know, the makeup of the group. And there's so many, I can see there's so many different techniques that teachers have of doing this. You know, you just have to find the way that works for you. But, you know, this is like the basic version and you can obviously upgrade it to, to whichever way you like. And don't throw the post-its away because those post-its can be placed on a wall. You can have a wonder wall, a wall where everyone's ideas are displayed. They can take five minutes and wander around and talk to each other, show their partner their sentence or the other group their sentences you know you can build an extension task you know they've done the speaking now they have the post-its and then they have to write something by you know comparing everyone's ideas and they take the ideas that they like best for example so there's so many different possibilities here this is just our starting point okay and then we have again another really nice activity which i love um, these are part of my toolkit, my teacher toolkit, my bag of tricks. I love using dice in the classroom. And if they are different colors, even better. So let's say you have two groups of students. Okay. Ones have a green dice and ones have a blue or a red dice. And you have some questions you want to do review. Let's see how much they remember from our unit. But we're focusing on speaking clearly. Yeah, we want them to work in their groups. We want them to explore the ideas together. So what could we do then for the green, the green group who have the green dice? We're going to have some questions. My questions are a little bit high level for students in, um, in baccalaureate, like in, in year five of secondary school. Uh, but you could have any questions. The questions are irrelevant. The questions will be relevant to your topic. How many questions do you need? Anyone want to answer in the chat? For each group? You need to have how many? Ten? You need to have six. Six sides of the dice, yeah? And you give them the dice and in their group, they're going to ask and answer the questions. They're going to roll the dice depending on the number which comes up. That's the question that they either ask themselves or have to answer themselves, or maybe they have to choose a victim among their group and say, okay, I'll roll the dice. And whichever number comes up is going to be John's question. He's going to have to answer. It again depends on how you want it to work. Yeah. So here are some of my examples, which are a little bit, a bit high level, but the questions are irrelevant. You decide on your questions for your group, depending on the topic. But there's so many things you can do with dice, yeah? Absolutely amazing uh, number of uh, versions of this game that you can use. So anyone, does anyone have any ideas? What would you use here for the dice? Has anyone used dice before? And if so, add it to the chat and let us know. It'd be lovely to see how you might use this in your lessons. Oh, Corinne says, I have it for Jim. I mean, you could have, for example, six adjectives, happy, sad, clever, intelligent, you know, anything. You could have verbs, you could have, you know, functional language, like, you know, phrases for, for agreeing or disagreeing, you have to make a sentence. Nice. Okay. So we've got a grammar board game as well. And Guy says synonyms and antonyms. I mean, the possibilities are absolutely endless. Yeah. For vocabulary. Yeah. I mean, trust me, buy some dice. It's really, really useful. They, they are really useful for the classroom. Yeah. And of course, they're speaking and they're enjoying it and they're having fun. What more could we ask? Yeah, number of dice, 
Heba says, number of dice, number of lesson questions, maybe. Exactly. And then, of course, like Lier says, you've got, I like story dice with pictures on. You know, again, a different version of dice. Okay, lots of lovely ideas. And I think I think we're actually almost coming to the end, which is nice because I'm doing well for my time. So next one is... Um, Again, you can see my dice in the photographs. These are some of my students, yeah? Really easy, get them to create a game, an end of unit content game, yeah? They're collaborating, your students are doing the work. They have created the little cards. On the picture on the left, you can see a very basic game. We have numbers, we have words written, we have images, and they're basically playing a board game, but they're talking, they're using their English. Maybe they have to make a sentence, Depends on the level of your students, of course. Maybe they just have to read what's on it or they have to spell something. And in the photograph on the right-hand side, perhaps, again, you've asked your students using those post-its that we had from before, because basically all you have there is post-its either stuck to their desks or on a piece of cardboard. And you can find little counters. In this case, I've got little figures and little animals. You give them the dice and they... Um, play the board game and there can be any challenge on the board game it can be you know make a sentence with it two past tense verbs or you know um, talk for one minute about your hobbies and the students create the challenges the students play the game and they're all collaborating together they're talking um, it's a very nice way for you to see who is managing the conversation. They're not thinking about, oh, this is English now. I have to, you know, they're playing a game, but they're using the target language while they're playing the game. Um, really popular for my students. They absolutely love it. And I even do this with teachers when I do teacher training. I actually do this exactly the same thing with them. And um it's really nice to see them, the how, how, how much fun they have. My advice to you is to get them to make the questions or the challenges in one lesson and then you know, create that expectation to then play the board game in the next lesson. I don't think it's uh, doable in one hour because they have to create the game. So, you know, my advice is, you know, create a bit of expectation, get them to create the game and then leave the playing of the game to the next lesson, because then they're going to come like really keen to participate and, and they'll want to review their sentences and challenges to make sure that the other team is probably going to lose, you know, because <laughs> they get quite competitive. Yeah, okay, so nice, nice motivating speaking activity there. And then one that I actually came across through Herbert Pukta. I'm sure many of you have heard of Herbert Pukta, who's like a bit of an ELT guru. He has written a lot of books. Um, and I've added the link here in the slide um, to his video on YouTube. But basically his recommendation is that again, um, to make speaking a competition in your lessons, um, group your learners into different teams, have each team name on the poster, and then create the person who has the timer or the stopwatch to see how long they can stay in the target language. And you chart the time, the seconds or the minutes, hopefully. Um, and again, it's this competitive element that keeps them talking and keeps them wanting to continue. So on the poster, each team is logging the number of minutes or seconds that they have remained in English or the target language. And, um, you know, it becomes, as I said before, this competitive thing. And then they can win a prize at the end of the academic term or the week, depending on how your course works. Um, you know, and it's really, again, it's very empowering when they see um, those minutes and seconds, they see them increasing and they think, oh, last week we only spoke together for one minute in English and this week we've managed to speak for five minutes in English. It's just one kind of tiny, you know, tweak to what you're doing in the classroom, one easy way to get them engaged and keeping them talking in the lesson. Okay. And I think in terms of timing, I've done pretty well today. <laughs> kind of pleased with myself. <laughs> Amazing. We can tell you're a teacher, your time, time to perfection. <laughs> 
So it was lovely to have all those amazing ideas in the chat. Wow, I'm, I'm taking away lots today. Thank you so much. Lots of ideas for me to take away there today. So I'll move to the question slide. Any questions? Okay, thank you so much, Shona. That was brilliant. And, and so many practical ideas that I can see people are really keen to, to try out in their classrooms. Um, so we've had lots of interesting questions, actually. Two oh, that are similar that I, I picked out. So there's one from Georgiana about how can we make our very uh, shy students speak? Um, and a similar one from Fiona about anxiety levels. Do you have any specific tips for students that are shy or anxious about speaking? Yeah, well, kind of like what I said before is allowing them that space to work maybe with a friend, with a partner that they feel comfortable with. Um, not expecting them initially to participate in open class. So, you know, as teachers, we kind of, you know, we're, we're full on, we're very dynamic and we're like, yeah, okay. And we nominate without thinking sometimes. I think be very careful when you're nominating um, students to speak in open class, maybe use that, those exploratory moments to allow that student to sit with a partner they feel comfortable with. And also, depending on the age of the students, I think this kind of like magic stone idea that gives you the power to speak more confidently is a really nice idea. Clearly, it depends on the age of your learners. But if you just find a stone and you paint it a lovely color, you know, or anything kind of special, and you tell them, this is our magic stone, it gives us confidence to speak English, you can try, you know, it's, it's a question of trial and error. You just have to find something that works with those students. But certainly those are some things that have worked with me, finding a friend that they feel comfortable working with and listening in, seeing how they're managing speaking with their partner or having one of those gimmicks and those little things that we can use, those prompts that um, encourage them to speak a little bit more. I love that. We didn't know that we needed, we, so we need a magic stone. Uh, we need spray. <laughs> But um, I love, love the fact that there's a, an element of humor and imagination with those. those yeah, things. yeah. And, you know, you know, a small kid, I mean, that's specifically for small children. But, you know, anything that's sparkly and beautiful, they will get attached to it. And you think this is, you know, this gives you the power to speak confidently and accept anything that they say, even if it's one word so that you are building their confidence. Yeah. Always lots of encouragement. Yeah. OK. Um, Great. So there was another question actually from Fiona again about um, speaking difficulties according to different learner types. Do you have any thoughts about um, specific difficulties people can have and how to overcome those? Oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a difficult question. A good one. Difficult question. Good question. <laughs> I think it kind of depends on their difficulty. So let's say the difficulty is pronunciation. Um, for example, you know, you could start very, very, very kind of on a small scale with like very small tongue twisters or starting with words that they they like or words that they have difficulty producing and maybe build up a vocabulary bank. Um, I'm also very keen on this idea of, although it's kind of unfashionable, let's say, of drilling, you know, drilling as a fun activity, like I sometimes do like a clapping thing so that everyone is talking together initially and then you hope that students will start taking the lead and will want to lead the activity so you know like a chant um, and clapping hands or clapping their knees so there's a bit like that kind of embodied con cognition where they're moving and speaking at the same time using their bodies maybe a little bit of tpr it kind of depends on what the difficulty is so i think you'd need to do a bit of um, background work on thinking is it a pronunciation problem do they not have enough vocabulary do they have the chunks of phrases that they need maybe create a poster for them or ask them to create a poster or one of these cheat sheets that they have on their desk which maybe help them too yeah exactly okay thank you mm. it's interesting that you mentioned drilling because it's kind of out of fashion now mm. um, but it's it's actually a really satisfying and useful thing that lots of learners can do even a complete beginner actually can find it quite satisfying listening and really just trying to imitate yeah sounds and if you accompany that with a bit of clapping and chanting wow the kids love it and it, it <laughs> creates rapport as well because you know they're doing it as a team you know and they're all trying to be in sync and be synchronized and do it together I mean it's really good for team building as well so um highly recommendable 
Okay, excellent. Um, there's lots of interesting questions. I don't know if there's any that you can see in the Q and A that you would like to to Let's have a look. Um, okay. If collect more, but um, well, there's one here: anxiety levels, which is kind of oh, that was the one you mentioned from Fiona. Yeah, yeah. I think having these little gimmicks, like we said, the motivation spray, the 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 speak better English spray. I mean, you can call it what you like, you know, is as long as it's going to get them on board. Um, maybe the seating. Do we need to arrange the seating into a specific layout to make the students talk more? That is from, is that Fatia? I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. That's an interesting question because it was on one occasion I discovered myself, well, another teacher was observing me and she'd said that the way the tables were organized in the classroom made me as the teacher stay to only one side of the room. And I hadn't realized. So the seating arrangement can actually impact on the dynamic of the lesson. So it is really important to think about where you're gonna put students. And is the position of the tables and chairs going to help the, this, the collaborative activity or is it going to be a hindrance? Is it going to, you know, not allow them to, to collaborate well? And the same with you as the teacher. If you're staying behind your desk too much, then maybe, you know, the students feel that you're a little bit distant. So I do think it is worthwhile planning the seating in your lessons. And again, if you have students like the person before mentioned who are very anxious or lacking confidence, you have to really think about who you're gonna sit them next to um, in order to build their confidence and help them feel comfortable. So really good question, that is quite important. Thank you, that is really interesting actually, isn't it? How, how even just taking away a desk, if there's a desk in between uh, two people that are talking to each other, it kind exactly. of is mm. far behind, you take away the desk, then they, they kind of have to communicate. Yeah, so it might take five minutes to move the tables around, but it's, it's well worth doing that if you think it's going to help the communication in the classroom. Yeah, that's If great. it's possible. I know some classrooms it's not possible, but... Yeah, that's a really great point. Mm. Um, what else have okay, we... Okay, let's see. So we're talking about the shy ones. Mm. There's, there's a question here about... Uh, sorry, what were you going to say? Have you seen a good one? No, no, you go ahead. I'm just kind of trying to read very quickly. So if you yeah, have a question, that's fine. There's one here from um, Dimbrav Reggie that says, um, a teacher who's a teacher in Nigeria. And, and he says, um, he's, I love this session because it's practical orientated. However, a lot of um, teaching materials, I think he means, are being utilised. Who provides these, the teacher or the government? And he's saying in, in Nigeria, the teacher has to make provisions for all of these yeah what, that's what, a good point actually yeah mm. well there's one activity which I haven't mentioned today which is like not necessarily for speaking it's a snowball activity where we just crumple old bits of paper we just recycle the paper from the paper bin and and we get the students we draw a circle on the board or you can draw a circle on the floor uh, and you can use that to get the students to throw bits of paper. So again, like in the circle, you might have verbs or vocabulary, but it's a very kind of basic way to do that. I mean, just using pieces of paper rolled up into a ball. You can do the pose, pause, pounce, bounce activity with a piece of paper rolled up into a ball. You know, there are ways around it, even just little objects that you have at home. The special object could be a button from your shirt, you know, like a nice shiny button. That could be the object that gives you the power of speaking in English, you know, it's like, so, you know, it's, I think it's just using your kind of creative imagination a little bit and, and just trying to think, what do I have at home that I could use, which is going to be attractive for my students, yeah? Um, and, you know, making use of paper, recycled material, bottle caps, anything. You could have an old bucket and they have to throw, you could put a word on the bucket and they have to throw objects into the bucket. You know, the, you know the, there's anything. It's just trying to see them with new eyes, these objects that you have at home. Yeah, I love it. I love it that the, the special stone is just is just a stone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, a shell from the beach, maybe? Yeah, exactly. And a, a yeah. nice and object. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, that's great. I think unfortunately we're kind of out of out of time. We're going to have to finish. Thank you 
so much Shona, it's been absolutely great. Uh, thank you for all our participants, you've also been great and lots of really interesting comments. Um, yeah. so the next session will be starting in 15 minutes time, so you've got a quick break. Um, there's links going into the chat now for the certificate and the handouts and um, to find the recording as well, because there was so much in here. Um, mm -hmm. So if you want to remind yourself of the things Shona said and exactly how those activities work, then you can always come back and watch the recording. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice one. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Really, you rock. <laughs> you made rock. my academic year. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thanks. thanks, Joe. Thanks, everyone. It was a pleasure. OK, see you everybody in the next session, hopefully. Bye bye. Bye.